<laughs> Sorry about that. So we can get going now. Shall I start now then? Yes. Okay, just uh, remember when I say next, um, move to the uh, next slide. So I've already been introduced. Uh, uh, my talk today is on why open education resources for learning. And uh, I'll be arguing today uh, that they're not just a good thing for learning, uh, but I, I believe that they're indispensable, that uh, we really must move away from commercial content and use open educational resources. Next. All the slides here are under a Creative Commons uh, open license and uh, with uh, attribution. However, some of the images are, are being used under fair dealing in Canada or fair use in the United States. So I'm not sure what the position is in your country. Next. Well, I'm here to support the 2012 Paris OER declaration and uh, basically uh, what this means is that uh, the UNESCO and the Commonwealth of Learning got together to support open education resources to help in the achievement of strategic development goal for uh, education for all. Nobody's saying that OER are the solution, uh, but uh, we do believe that uh, the OER will form part of the solution or many solutions uh, that might come forward. Next. <clears throat> and there are many shareholders in open education and uh, you have a, a few in, uh, in South Africa. And uh, this gives you an idea. They're in all different uh, continents. And there's about 20 of us now are working to support open education resources and working with many other groups and organizations. Next. And this is part of uh, what I believe is the challenge for the 21st century. And it's estimated that by 2025, there'll be almost 100 million new students capable of post-secondary education, uh, but they won't be able to access it. And John Daniel in 2015 told us that we would have to be building four new <coughs> universities a week of 30,000 students in order to meet this demand. And we know that's impossible. And so we have to look at new ways for mass learning, helping people everywhere to have access to affordable and quality education. Next. And the question for us is, how do we educate all these learners? And uh, the uh, uh, former Canadian Governor General, she put it this way, that education is a weapon of mass construction. That is to say that if we're going to build any new society in the 21st century, education is the weapon that we need. Next. <clears throat> because of the coronavirus, and uh, um, we're suffering from that here in Canada, as, as you are everywhere, um, um, and it started in China, but China made a huge move towards online learning because the cor coronavirus has shut schools. And this is happening all over the world. And uh, in Canada, uh, just about every university and most schools are now using uh, online learning in order to reach students. This is a major shift. I call it uh, the distance education for so long has been a Cinderella and now it's become a princess. That uh, online learning is becoming uh, a great part of what education will be in the future. It will form an integral part of any 21st century education. Next. The universities are now embracing e-learning like never before. Uh, unfortunately, too many of them uh, do not know how to go about it. And uh, 
for the most part, they're just putting lectures onto videos and uh, uh, giving access to students. And we in distance education know there's a lot more to teaching online than that. And so we need to train people, to, uh, train our teachers and our students on how to learn online. And the open universities have a real advantage in that regards because we've been doing it for years. And many now are coming to Wathabaski University for advice. And uh, our student enrollments have gone up 12% just in the month of April. So there is a big move towards uh, embracing e-learning. Next. And of course, Zoom, which we're using today, video conferencing, uh, um, uh, apparently its stock value has tripled. Whereas in the stock market, all the stocks are going down, Zoom is booming. And it's because people are now looking to online video conferencing, uh, not just for education, but for all forms of business and business relations. Next. Mobile learning is something that we need to uh, be not just aware of, but we should be right in the middle of it. Next. And I tell this story uh, back in 1999, this is over 20 years ago, I was driving through a small village in the Philippine Islands that had no electricity. And I slammed on the brakes because I could not believe what I saw. And what I saw was a farmer behind two oxen in a rice paddy and he was digital messaging. In 1999 in Canada, nobody was digital messaging. It just did not exist. And I found out that in 1999, the Philippines did more digital messaging than any other country in the world per person. And I checked this year and they still do more digital messaging per person than any other country in the world. But what struck me me back in 1999 was I realized that the device he held in his hand was a powerful computer. In fact, more powerful than the desktop I had back in my office two years earlier. And that's when I began to think, how can we use these devices for learning? And now they're becoming ubiquitous. Everyone seems to be able to have access to a mobile phone. Next. What's happening is digital convergence. And I made this particular slide back in 19, uh, 2004. And I made it because I was amazed at these devices. Look at what they could do. A, a book, a radio, telephone, computer, personal distance education. Uh, 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 advice, game player, fax machine, camera, the World Wide Web browser, email, clock, and you could use it as a phone. And uh, at the time, people were amazed by this. And today, this looks like a joke, really. There are over 2 million applications for your mobile device more than 100,000 medical uh, applications for your device. So what we're looking at is ubiquitous learning is possible using these devices. Next. Pervasive computing is with us. Next. There are 2 billion internet connections in the world and the world population is greater than 7.8 billion. Next, one quarter of the world's population now accesses the internet. Next, the world is going mobile. So we need as educators to understand that we need to be using mobile learning, that to take advantage of these devices to help promote learning everywhere. Next. There are 5 billion mobile devices, over 3 billion mobile internet users, 
Next. One out of every three people only access the internet using a mobile device. And that isn't just in developing countries, it's even in the developed countries now. Um, we all are using our mobile devices to access the internet far more uh, than any other device. Next. So the mobile growth is continuing through 2020. 5.4 billion people with mobile phones. People with electricity, 5.3 billion. So people even without electricity have phones. There's people with bank accounts, four and a half billion. People with running water, three and a half billion. People with cars, 2.8 billion. People with landline, 2.2 billion. The era of the landline is going the way of the dinosaurs. It's mobile phones are taking over, mobile devices, which are far more than any phone. Next. So what does that tell us as educators? It's this. When designing courses, do not design for paper. Do not design for a desktop. Design for mobile first. If you design your lessons to fit on a mobile device, you can easily port them to paper or to a, a larger screen on a, uh, on a desktop or even a laptop. So we need to rethink education in terms of designing for mobile devices first. Next. The internet is the biggest commons. It is the common heritage of mankind. Next. The public domain is a priceless shared heritage. This is where people can learn. All of the world's knowledge is going online and made more and more accessible, especially with open education resources. There are some who are making, trying to make closed gardens and force people to pay and have subscriptions to knowledge. Uh, but there is a huge amount of knowledge freely available to all of us online. Next. You look at the idea of copying and in, in the present terms, people are looking at copying as if there's something wrong with it, as if it's something evil. And I'd like to point out that scriptural scribes for 20,000 years were copyists, and they were the most respected people in society. Tom Harper put it this way, that the concept of copyright was utterly foreign to the ancient mind. That is, if you had a transcript, uh, a manuscript, you could copy it. Nobody even questioned whether or not you could make a copy of it. Next. However, in the 6th century in Ireland, St. Columba, or Columkill as he's known in Ireland, um, he copied St. Finian's psalm book. And he, King, King Dermot ruled against him and said he could not do that. He said, to every cow it's calf, to every book it's copy. And he ruled against copying. After that, there was a big battle at Culladrine in the west of Ireland, 3,000 men died in battle and Columkill won. Uh, but later he was exiled to Scotland, but he brought all of his copyists with him. And from Scotland, he, his, his uh, monks went all over Europe, spreading the word and spreading learning during the Dark Ages in Europe. Next. So copyright, what does it mean? It was instituted to encourage learning and promote the progress of science and the useful arts. It was not introduced to protect the rights of the author. And this is a big misconception that so many people have. They think that copyright is there to protect the author. There is nothing further from the truth. The truth 
is very clear. Copyright was instituted to encourage learning and promote the progress of science and the useful arts. And here I'm talking about the British common law tradition where most of the Commonwealth, if not all of the Commonwealth countries uh, get their version of copyright. Next. Jazzy calls it para-copyright. This idea that it's there to protect the rights of authors is quasi-copyright. It's phony copyright. The copyright laws, laws that we are under today have developed from the Statute of Queen Anne, 1710. And look at the title. It's not an act to, to uh, protect the rights of authors. It's an act for the encouragement of learning. I think this is very important and as educators, we should know this, that the original copyright came about not to give rights to the author, but to limit their rights. To say you have a right to it, a monopoly of it for a few years, because we believe this could help in encouraging learning. Next. In American copyright, and again, um, we have to be very uh, uh, knowledgeable about American copyright because they are basically forcing their version of copyright on just about every country in the world. But look at the origin of American copyright. It's not an act to protect authors. It's an act to promote the progress of science and the useful arts. Again, it's for us as educators that copyright was put forward originally. Next. Thomas Jefferson put it this way. It's peculiar character is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mine. As he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. So when you allow people to copy, you are not giving anything away. You are giving it and keeping it at the same time. I think this is very important that we understand that as a concept. You're not giving anything away when you allow use of copy, your copyright. You still have it. Next. Jefferson said, I set out on this ground, which I suppose to be self-evident, that the earth belongs in usufruct to the living, that the dead have neither powers nor rights over it. Well, this is very, this is very important. Because right now, all around the world, they are forcing, and this is the Americans and Europeans, forcing other countries to accept a term limit of 70 years after the death of the author for copyright. Right now in many countries it's 50 years as it is in Canada, uh, but there is huge pressure to extend it. And what that means is that dead people have rights over living people. And uh, there's something very wrong with that as President Je Jefferson pointed out. Next. He said, inventions cannot be the subject of property. You will hear the term all the time bandied about uh, intellectual property. This is a very recent term, came out about with the international, uh, 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 um, what is it, the, uh, the United Nations International Pro Property Office, Intellectual Property Office. And they try to call it property, but it is not property. It is a monopoly. James Madison put it this way, that incentive, not property or natural law, is the foundational justification for American copyright. It is a privileged monopoly. And I think that's where we need to look at it and think of copyright not as property. You do not own the book. You have a monopoly over the book for a limited period of time. And it is, 
it is there are many court decisions in Commonwealth in Commonwealth countries asserting that that it is a monopoly rather than property, no matter how much they use the word property. Yeah, yes. I'll continue. John Perry Barlow put it this way, the greatest constraint on your future liberties may come not from government, but from corporate legal departments laboring to protect by force what can no longer be protected by practical efficiency or general social consent. Next. So copyright, what does it mean? It means no one owns ideas. They belong to everyone. Copyright holders possess a copyright. Copyright protects the expression of ideas, not the ideas. And the holders have a limited right to control the expression of their ideas for a limited time. Next. What it doesn't mean is droit d'auteur or the author's right. And that is the European conception of, uh, copy, of copyright, droit d'auteur. And that is very different from the British common law version. Next. What it is, is not property. It is not intellectual property. Copyright is a privileged monopoly that we grant to authors in order to promote science and the useful arts. Next. But they use the word property. William Blackstone put it this way. There's nothing which so generally strikes the imagination and engages the affections of mankind as the right of property. That's why they use the term property, even though our legal system does not recognize it as property. Next. This poem came from the, uh, uh, probably the late 18th or early 19th century. Uh, they hang the man and flog the woman who steals the goose from off the common, but leaves the greater villain loose who steals the common from off the goose. And I, I use this poem to, to say that the internet is our intellectual commons. It is the intellectual commons of all of humanity. And uh, they try to punish people who, uh, who uh, uh, copy and uh, uh, take, take information from it. And they don't punish anyone who tries to close it off and put in walled gardens and hides their content behind subscriptions and everything else and tries to take the commons away from everybody. Next. Lawrence Leggis put it this way. Monopoly controls have been the exception in free societies. They have been the rule in closed societies. Next. So, Open education resources. How do they fit into this framework? And I'm going to throw a few ideas at you now to show that yes, we need to be online. Yes, we need to be mobile. And yes, in order to do that, we need open educational resources. Next. The latest definition is from the UNESCO and their learning, teaching, and resource material in any format and medium that resides in the public domain or are under copyright that have been released under an open license. Next. And an open license refers to a license that respects the intellectual property rights of the copyright owner and provides permissions granting the pu public the rights to access, reuse, repurpose, adapt, and redistribute educational materials. And as you can see on the left, the most free is a public domain. There's no copyright on it. And the next best is CC BY. So that means you can copy, but you must put attribution. 
And then next to that, you have CC by share alike. You can use it any way you like, but you must keep the same license. Now the others below are not recommended. They do serve their purposes from time to time, but adding non-commercial or no derivatives um, is, uh, creates problems for people who want to use their, uh, their open education resources in a very open way. Next. So OER, they could be textbooks, they could be games, they could be um, uh, uh, curriculum material, they could be podcasts, they could be video casts, they could be uh, video lectures, games, all kinds of different things. The key that makes them OER is that they have an open license. Next. I doubt if anyone here has heard of the unit of measurement called the twitch. I think most of you know what a twitch is, is where you move your eye or your head or something in a quick, quick manner. Uh, but it is also a unit of measurement in computer game design. Next. It is equal to two jiffies or 200 milliseconds. Well, electrons on a wire in 200 milliseconds can travel 20,000 kilometers. Guess what? There is nowhere on earth further away than 20,000 kilometers. And these, this twitch is the amount of time it takes you to move a joystick or, or press a mouse button. That's it, 200 milliseconds, and it can go anywhere on earth. What does that tell us? That God, in his or her infinite wisdom, designed the world perfectly for playing video games. And video games are a very effective way of learning. Right now, many of these video games are promoting huge learning a lot of it is not the type of learning we as educators would like them to learn. Shoot them up games, etc. But people learn very quickly when they're engaged in these games. We need to look at them much more in order to uh, promote future learning. Next. So you have Creative Commons. You stick to the two, uh, uh, the two open um, licenses on the left, Creative Commons Attribution or Creative Commons Attribution Share alike. The no derivatives means they can't change it, so it, it creates problems for education. And non-commercial, there are so many different versions of non-commercial in so many different countries that it makes it very difficult for others to make use of the uh, content. Next. <clears throat> so what's the way forward is this that all publicly funded content should be open licensed and as a Canadian uh, we don't like praising the United States very much but the former President Obama uh, was the one who came up with this and he brought this to the attention of Europe and Canada and many other countries and he championed the idea that all publicly funded content should be openly licensed. Next. <clears throat> so with open education resources, you can mix them, create a new resource. You can adapt them to many different contexts. You can extract what you don't like, take it out. You can localize, change it to suit your university or your region or your country. You can translate them to another language. You can reuse and repurpose them in many different ways. Next. They can be augmented, added to, edited, customized, aggregated, reformatted. You can have mashups. So they're very flexible tools for use in educational uh, uh, environments. 
Next. We can now start thinking of course assembly, assembling courses. Rather than thinking of creating courses from scratch, we can look at assembling them, taking open education resources from different areas and putting them in and integrating them into a full course. Next. They're good for access. OER provide access to high quality content, additional materials, supplementary materials. Next. Savings and efficiency. Uh, there's a marginal cost and effort in making copies. It costs you nothing to copy them. Next. Speed and immediacy. Um, if you find it online, you can use it immediately. So it creates, so uh, you can create courses very quickly just by going online, adopting an OER and using it in your class. Next. Sharing. You can create material or you can use others material and you're freely available. You can share it anywhere you want. Doesn't matter copyright law in all different jurisdictions. You can share it. Next. You can republish it. You can make multiple copies. Next. You can take multiple channels for learning. There may be different ways that different people learn and you can put all of those ways together and uh, direct them to a OER that helps them to understand the concepts. Next. You can have multiple versions of the same concept so that if a student understands exactly the way you're explaining it, they can go and find an OER that explains it in a different way. And this is very uh, essential in education, in a modern education. Next. With the wisdom of crowds, as more and more people use OER, they'll get better and better. They'll be improved. As each person uses them, they'll become more and more uh, uh available and um, of much more higher quality next they're great for informal and formal learning so if an oer is available anyone can access it and learn from it they do not have to be in a formal school environment so it's a great way to give access to people for learning next it bridges the gap by increasing access and personal interest courses, independent learning are possible using OER. Next. Again, OER course assembly. And I'm putting this on again because I think it's important to rethink the instructional design process and start thinking in terms of assembling courses. Next. You can construct OER also, and this is a uh, a, a new way that's coming to the fore is that working with students to construct OER. And we all know that if you, if you build something and create something, uh, you learn much better. And uh, this is a very, uh, a very good way of using OER to involve students. Next. So you can have learner generated content with new ways of co-constructing ideas, knowledge created, targeted, and shared. And uh, this is a, a, a very effective way of promoting learning. Next. Partnering. You can partner with people in your own country, your own institution, um, outside your country and in other institutions. Partnering is made very simple with the absence of not having to deal with copyright restrictions. Next. Mass participation is possible. Because everyone has the right to access the content, uh, you can have huge masses of people all working and uh, developing good quality content. Next. You can self-produce, uh, publish it as you like or you can get uh, printers to print it out for you. Uh, you can put, have webmasters put it on the web for you. Uh, you can do it any way you like. Next. You can individualize. 
you can have a no one size fits all textbook or curriculum. So it can be adapted. It's not just one textbook that everybody has to learn from, uh, but you could adapt it for the needs of different students, adding and uh, taking out chapters that are not relevant. Next. Online collaborations, again, um, uh, we are beginning to realize that collaboration is an important skill in the workplace and online collaborations in particular, especially with COVID-19 now, where all kinds of billions of people are now collaborating online. And you can do this most effectively with open educational resources. Next. Archives, you can put OER into archives. They can provide a web-based, viewable, reusable re reward record of quality educational materials. Again, you're not allowed to uh, archive uh, uh, commercial content like that. Next. International collaborations. Um, again, OER are essential because of the wide range of different copyright laws in so many different countries. It is very uh, almost impossible to come up with a, uh, a, commercial, uh, um, a commercial license uh, that you can use properly in uh, many different countries. It, if it's commercial, it has to be licensed separately in every different country. Next. For blended learning, which is coming in, and again, I, I refer to COVID-19, where people are now looking at blended learning. All of these online traditional classrooms are now going online. And uh, I believe that when they come back, it won't ever again return to just being in the classroom. It'll be blended, where people will be using uh, both online and classroom-based. Um, material. So this helps with collaborations, knowledge sharing, cost savings, quality improvements, independent learning, and communications and community engagement. All of these things are possible with OER. Next. Or, next, you can just take the whole package. You don't have to build courses with OER. There are full courses, full textbooks already available. And if you don't want to spend your time developing and building and constructing and adapting and assembling a course together, you can take the whole course package. And it seems that about 70 to 80% of teachers, that's what they want. So there are a lot of old course packages now being developed uh, for open educational resources. Next. And I suggest that uh, you go to the commonwealthoflearning.org and you will find many uh, different uh, pamphlets, uh, leaflets, books, um, et cetera, on open education resources uh, as you need more information. Next. Just quickly, in Canada, we had the Pentalogy decision, the Canadian Supreme Court. Next. And what it said was that fair dealing must be given, must be given a large and liberal interpretation. And that means that in common, common law countries, this is the only uh, decision of a Supreme Court in any of the com British common law countries and it says that fair dealing must be given a large and liberal interpretation so that means you can also use portions of, of uh, commercial content and you have every legal right to do that and i think people should take advantage of that next so the real top reasons i believe why oer are essential are for two reasons Digital rights management, which is a, refers to digital locks on, couple, on, on content, and digital licenses. Next. 
I call it digital restrictions management rather than digital rights management. Next. Digital rights management, or we call it technological protection measures, or digital locks, are defective by design. They go in, this, uh, this software, this lock software, goes into your computer's operating system and it limits the way you can use your device. Next. They've actually done it in the past where they've gone into people's devices and taken out books that people have purchased. The most notable ca case was with Animal Farm in 1984, where Amazon sold it and then took it back, went into people's computers and took it off. And uh, the great Amazon purge of 2008 was when they went in and took off all the eBooks from everybody who had purchased one. So it, uh, it, it, it's a way that they control your device. Next. DRM software needs deep permissions into the operating system and it can stop normal operating system functions. It is defective by design. Next. Access codes are used by commercial content providers and students have to pay large sums in order to access the uh, digital textbooks and the uh, exercises that go along with them. Next. So with digital rights management, you cannot copy paste, annotate, highlight, you can't text to speech, you cannot change the format, you can't move the material to another computer, you can't print it out. You can't move it geographically. If you buy in South Africa, it will not work in Canada. If you use after the expiry date, uh, they take it off your computer. And you can't resell it like you can a book, a print book. So all of these things are stopped. They stop your device from allowing you to do these things. Next. But I would say to you that our device is our property. You remember before I said they have a monopoly. The copyright is not property, it is a monopoly. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> These digital locks restrict our freedom. And I make this very simple question. Can we not own and control our own property? Next, they put locks on our devices, but we're innocent. Next, we're innocent. Next, Cory Doctor put it this way, there's no theory of capitalism that says that my private property should be regulated by the state because there's a copyrighted work inside of it. Next. How many of you have seen this screen? The uploader's not made his video available in your country. We see this all the time in Canada. Next. And yes, the, uh, the copyright owners have actually tried to put in into the digital locks a way of destroying your device. And uh, it was even introduced into the United States Congress that they should be allowed to do that. Fortunately, it didn't go very far. Next. However, I hope none of you have seen this error 53 where uh, <clears throat> Apple, with their iPhones and iPads, uh, if you go to an unauthorized Apple dealer to get it fixed, the next time you upload the operating system, you get error 53. And it turns your iPhone into a brick. And uh, a few people uh, experienced this uh, about three or four years ago. Uh, but since then, um, Apple no longer does that. But it shows you the extent to which they will go in order 
to protect their, their monopoly and to affect your devices the way they want to affect your devices. Next. The Microsoft's ebook apocalypse shows the dark side of DRM. That's when all of the ebooks that you purchase from Microsoft, they just disappeared from your computer. Next. So who's losing? Any obstacle that makes a record harder to listen to is bad news for the artist that made it. With all of these digital locks, it makes the uh, commercial version uh, less easy to use than a pirated version. And so who's really losing? Next. Now, these digital locks are not the big problem because within days of any digital lock being put together, uh, there will be some hacker who will, do, who will be able to uh, get around it, to uh, 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 decipher it, figure it out and spread the word around the internet. So the digital locks are not the most important thing. What's more important are the digital licenses that make it illegal. So it's illegal for you to copy and paste, illegal for you to text to speech, illegal format change, printing it out, moving material, um, using it after expiry date. So that is now made illegal by digital licenses. I doubt if any of you have actually read the licenses when you click on I agree. Well, I have. I, I'm a bit of a nerd, so I've read quite a few of these licenses. And when you read these licenses, this is what you agree to. You agree that owners have no liability, even if their product doesn't work. You also agree that they can come into your computer without permission. They can collect and use your personal data. They agree that you have a privilege to use the product. You don't own it. You're prohibited to show the content to others. So can you imagine students doing their work, perhaps uh, collaboratively? They're not allowed to show their screen uh, to any other student. And you must accept that you have no rights. You remember earlier I talked about uh, uh, your rights as a uh, fair dealing rights. Well, you must accept that you have no rights when you click on I agree. So these licenses make it illegal and criminal in many countries to make the use of this. Next. They say we're going to own all of your stuff, whether you like it or not, deal with it. Next. Here's an uh, extract from the uh, what, uh, one license that they can come into your home announced or unannounced and whether located on the licensee's premises or elsewhere at any time. You've agreed to that. This is part of the license that you've agreed to, that they can come into your home and inspect your device at any time. Next. You could be put in prison. Uh, not just for plagiarism, next, but also because you showed your wife a page from your ebook, a criminal offense. Next. So, the point I am making here is that if we go to open e textbooks, if we go to open educational resources, you can copy, paste, annotate all you want. You can text to speech, change the format, move it, print it out, move it geographically. There's no expiry date. You can reuse it and you retain your privacy and digital rights. Open helps you to get away from all of these restrictions that are put on you by commercial content providers. Next. They are essential for e-learning implementation. That's why I say it's 
it's not a good thing to use OER. I believe that they are essential for use in e-learning. Next. Here's another one uh, in your license agreement. It expressly forbids you from using iTunes to create missiles, biological, chemical, or nuclear weapons. So if you do that, you've broken the law. Do not do that. Next. So here's a question. Do you own what you pay for? Of course, nobody reads their, uh, these digital licenses, so they don't understand it, that they don't own what they pay for. Next. Access right. The vendors, they want to control how, when, where, and with what specific brands of technological assistance audiences are able to access content. Next. They brought a new concept in the world. You buy, but you don't get. Do you remember the world we used to live in? where you bought something, you owned it. Do you remember that world? If you bought a hammer, nobody could tell you what kind of nails to use with it. Well, now everything you buy, they control it. They control what you do with it. They disable your computer, your mobile device in order to suit their preferences and what they want you to do with it. Next. Rory, sorry to interrupt. Um, just to let you know in time check, you've got five minutes left. Okay, I'm finishing up now. Thank you. Audrey Waters put it this way, we'll just share and rent on the powerful platforms of Silicon Valley billionaires. This is far from a satisfactory alternative. Next. Cory Doctorow says it's a return to feudalism where in the old days, the aristocrats owned everything, the people owned nothing. Now it's the companies own everything and the people own nothing. Next. And if you think that this is serious in education and problematic in education, it's in all fields. A farmer in Canada bought a, a Massey Ferguson tractor and Massey Ferguson disabled it by taking the software out. They wanted to charge him $10,000 to come and install the software. But uh, lucky for him, his 14 year old son went on the internet and found it in a pirate site and he was able to install the software himself. But that is illegal. And uh, it's turning everyone into criminals just so as they can fix their own machines. Your car, you do not own your car. You only own the metal and the rubber. You do not own the software that runs your car. Your car cannot run without that software and you do not own it. Look at this heart pump. You own the heart pump, but you do not own the software that's on it. So there's all kinds of problems in society coming from this, from this new world we live in. You buy, but you don't get. Next. Somehow the notion of actually owning the things you buy has become revolutionary. If you bought it, you should own it. It's as simple as that. Next. Everything you know is wrong and every day computers are making people easier to use. Next. But openness is the skeleton key that unlocks every attempt at vendor control and lock-in. So let them keep their strict copyright, uh, let them bring an even stricter copyright. If we as educators, we just go open, we can ignore them and bypass them. Next. The Royal Society in the UK is the oldest scientific society in the world. And they say that the restriction of the commons by patents, copyright, and databases is not in the interests of society and unduly hampers scientific endeavor. Next. And the previous Pope, Benedict, 
said on the part of rich countries, there is excessive zeal for protecting knowledge through an unduly rigid assertion of the right to intellectual property. What does this tell us? Next. That God is on our side. We, supporters of open education, we are on the side of the angels. Next. Thank you very much for your attention, and hopefully I'll be able to answer a few of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor McGreal. That was really insightful and fascinating. Um, and we would probably need a few hours just to unpack all of the, the different things that you've covered with us. But I, I really enjoyed the kind of your sharing of the history of copyright and what it really means and, and, and why it came into being. Um, but thank you for that really insightful overview. We have a few questions that are, have come through in the chat. So we'll try and address these. But in the meantime, if you have an additional question, please put that in the chat as well. Okay, so the, the one question we have uh, came from uh, Ruth, who says that the experience is that there's still a lot of institutional resistance about open educational resources. Uh, how can we handle this resistance to OER at an institutional level? Well, I'd say it, it varies uh, among faculty and it varies under your conditions because we've seen quite, uh, quite a range. So, for example, if you have faculty who are making money from selling their course material, you're going to have a problem convincing them. And uh, we had we had a professor here uh, at Athabasca, and uh, uh, he had a $250 accounting text. And every year we were buying about uh, two to 3,000 copies. So he did not support open educational resources. But uh, we got a new young teacher, and she um, went to open educational resources and uh, got a new book and now it saves the university 250 dollars times 2000 uh, students every every year so uh, um, it depends on the faculty members if faculty members are not making much money then they generally approve of it and and most faculty do not make much money uh, from selling content uh, but where they do, um, then it's problematic. I don't know how you convince them. You just have to bypass them and let it happen. Great, thank you. I think that, yes, it's definitely a case for, for in terms of cost reduction. Our next question comes from Karen, um, and she says, how can we ensure that educational resources that we've developed in Africa are visible and seen as quality material by other regions in the world. Often we feel that our local educational resources are of less quality, but that is not the case. Um, what tips can you give us for sharing our local resources and making them perhaps more marketable? The, this isn't just a problem for South Africa. Um, in Canada, uh, we look down our noses at the uh, material created in the United States and there's a huge amount of uh, material in the, in, uh, available in the United States. Um, but uh, but I, I think uh, the best way is to uh, get your material onto different uh, uh, repositories. There's quite a few different repositories international now, like uh, the one we use here a lot, BC Campus. It's, uh, it's for textbooks. And if you get it on BC campus, then people will find it. There's others, uh, uh, Rice University, and for K to 12, there's Kuriki. There's a lot of places like that. And uh, you'd, you'd probably have to send it to them and send them, see if they can put a link to your resources. Um, that, uh, that would help. But uh, I would say that, uh, Yes, there is a reluctance to use them. Um, uh, my, as I said, my own experience, even in the United States, where um, uh, 
biology and chemistry is pretty well the same around the world and still don't like to use American uh, American textbooks and uh, you find it in other countries. You find, for example, our uh, French Canadians do not, would not translate a book from English into French. They want to develop their own. So you have, you have a lot of these uh, problems. But I think as more and more become widely available, uh, that uh, people will more and more start to look around and find uh, different uh, content um, that's uh, uh, that's from South Africa. I believe there's a um, there's a group at the University of British Columbia that are using some of C. Avula's uh, material for. Uh, uh, indigenous uh, education, but uh, I'm not, I don't know a lot about it. Great, thank you. Um, a related question, but perhaps a bit more broader, um, is that often in dual universities, um, where there's both face-to-face -face teaching and distance uh, teaching happening, there's often a negative perception about distance education. Um, how can we motivate to university managers or executives um, to really provide more resources to advance distance education and possibly open education as well? Well, I think that COVID-19 has been a big, a big help in that regard. There's a saying that it's an ill wind that blows no good, but right now I'm seeing that uh, distance education cinderella has become a princess and everyone is getting into distance online education now and uh, all over the place because of covid 19. so in that sense there's been a, a major shift just this year and i believe that with that shift they'll realize they'll realize that the quality is there and uh, They'll, uh, we'll have more and we'll have more and more of it. Now, the idea that classroom-based learning is in any way better than online learning is absolutely ridiculous. And I'm going to repeat that: it's absolutely ridiculous. It is not based on any research. Um, there is no research that supports it. And in fact, uh, why was classroom-based why did classroom-based learning come about? It wasn't for any pedagogical reason. It was for one reason and one reason only, that there was only one copy of the manuscript. In the old days, you had to be in the classroom to have access to the manuscript as the lecturer read it. That's the only reason for classroom-based education. Well, now, we have the internet, everyone can access the manuscripts, whatever content they need. It just doesn't make any sense anymore. I, I call these people who believe in uh, educational creation, we call them uh, uh, creationists. That, uh, they believe that God created the classroom in its perfect form thousands of years ago, and it cannot be changed. And this is ridiculous. I take a more evolutionary stance and, and say that, uh, no, there's other possible ways of learning. And in fact, there always has been other possible ways of learning beside the classroom. So uh, yeah, they don't have a leg to stand on. And what bothers me is when distance educators start defending distance education. You don't defend distance education. This is the 21st century. You must have online learning. The whole world is online. There isn't a job around that isn't related to computers and online. If you're not online if, uh, as part of your education, you are not getting a 21st century education. You're fooling those students. You are being dishonest with them because you must be online to work in a modern economy. Even society, even society, people are meeting and getting married online. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's so obvious, and yet they still want to maintain 
a 19th century mode of learning in the 21st century. So I, I wouldn't uh, back down for them and come up with uh, defensive arguments. I tell them straight up, number one, you have no evidence whatsoever that classroom-based learning is better. This is a very, this is very important. There are over 300, 400 uh, studies on this. There are no studies that show that classroom-based education is better than online learning. So anyway, you, you got me on a harangue there, but I, I'm quite uh, zealous on that point. Yes, I think we can, we can all hear your passion coming through there, but, um, but we, we appreciate that insight, thank you. And I, I think you're correct in that um, COVID-19 is, is forcing many educators to possibly rethink some of the assumptions that they had about how learning happens um, in, the, in the current space that we're in. Okay, our next question um, is, I think you've part, partially addressed this, but uh, the question was, what websites or repositories would you recommend um, when people are looking for specific um, OERs? Um, just well, before I get you to answer that, just a quick also reminder for those uh, who, who don't know that we also have OER Africa, uh, which has some great OERs around teacher education, uh, agriculture and health education. So that's uh, oerafrica.org um, that has many resources that are locally based. Uh, but Professor McGrill, over to you. So the question was, what, what repositories or websites would you recommend for people looking for OERs? Um, well, I have a list of quite a few of them, but I would, uh, Oasis at the State University of New York, uh, BC Open Textbooks, the Commonwealth of Learning Oasis, um, ICD has uh, OER, uh, MIT Open Courseware, and the Open Education Consortium, and you've mentioned OER Africa, Open Stax, Kuriki for K-12 uh, information, sailor.org, that's quite a bit, I could just send you this and uh, you can circulate it, I've got a lot more on the list. Okay, great. Yes, I think um, if you could send us and we'll add that to the to the resources around this webinar, that would be great. Sure, um, yeah. Ruth has just mentioned also for people in teacher education that the TESA project also has some great re open educational resources. Um, and that's also an, an African project. Thank you, Ruth. Okay, um, the next question, um, but this one focus, uh, this, this focused on you when you were talking about mobile first design. Uh, so the question is, Having, as a distance educator, um, used to designing lessons for paper, um, how do academics kind of, uh, how do academics move towards looking to design their, their lessons for mobile first? How do they approach that? Uh, well, I, I think that the, uh, um, there, there are some open access books on mobile learning that uh, explain some of the uh, problems with it. And uh, sometimes uh, um, it's a matter of making a, a very few changes in the code so as it will fit for any screen size. And, uh, and then you can do it. But uh, for, I would read, like Muhammad Ali has written, uh, uh, his, well, they're edited books. He has a few of them and uh, they approach it from many different uh, uh, ways. And I, I would recommend that uh, take a look at those and see what they're doing and how they're doing it. And uh, I could even put you in touch with Muhammad Ali uh, uh, my, myself. He's at our university. Great, yes, yes, I, yes. I, I, he is an expert in, um, in mobile learning and I think possibly if we can, we can get, um, share some of the, the resources that he has available. That would be great. Okay, um, the next question is um, in terms of, ah, this is an interesting one. So this question is think, talking about plagiarism. So in a situation where content is being uh, remixed um, and you're using um, text from various sources, uh, using OERs, etc., um, how does that impact on something 
around plagiarism? Does it impact on how we define plagiarism or what it means to plagiarize? Well, I, I think the key is, is that uh, play, you cannot plagiarize. So what you do is you put the name of the person, uh, the author, and that's why you have CC by license, Creative Commons Attribution. You must attribute. And even if you're using public domain uh, material, you don't have to attribute legally, uh, but as a scholar, if you don't, you'll be in big trouble because it's plagiarism. So although public domain, you can just take whatever it is and use it any way you want, uh, you must put down the author. Otherwise, uh, then it is, it's, it's plagiarism. So at all, at all cases, you must give a reference to the original author. Now, you do this if you're using the expression of the idea. But if you take their idea, um, then there's no plagiarism. If you write it up in a different way, that's not plagiarism. However, uh, just out of professional ethics, uh, you might want to mention that you got the idea from that person. But uh, plagiarism is uh, when you copy somebody's ideas in the way they present their ideas. And uh, um, actually with OER, it's, uh, it's a lot easier to, uh, uh, to avoid plagiarism. Yes, I think the, the key point there is that it's, it's, it's so important to make sure that you correctly cite um, where your sources, you know, the information that you have, where, where it comes from. And OERs does make it easier for you to be able to, to say where you found the information. We, we are running out of time, unfortunately. Um, but just, I think the last question comes from Jenny. Um, and she says, um, could you give us some examples of where open universities or distance uh, universities where they've got examples of the majority of their courses are made available as, as OERs? Um, I'd say that sailor.org, S-A-Y-L-O-R.org, and OERU.org. They're the, they're the main ones. And BC Campus, it's not a university, but it works with all the universities in British Columbia. And uh, BC Campus has an open repository of uh, textbooks that are uh, freely available. Great, thank you. Uh, yes, I, I do know that OERU is doing some really interesting um, work in this space. Unfortunately, we have run out of time. Um, I apologize if we haven't gotten to your question, um, but please, uh, Rory's put his email address. It's on the screen. So Rory at athabascau.ca. So if you have a, a question or something that you'd like to find out more about from him, I'm sure that if you email him, he, he will respond to you. Uh, Professor McGreal, thank you so much for availing yourself for us uh, today. It's afternoon here in South Africa, but I know it's early morning in, in where you are in Canada. So I think I appreciate you getting up early for us and sharing your incredible experience about OERs and, and making sure, making again the case, particularly in the times where we're in of COVID-19 about the case and the need for open educational resources and how they can impact on our educational practices. Um, is there anything you'd like to perhaps just say as a, as a final point before we close? Yes. Uh... Uh, thank you very much for this uh, invitation. I always look forward to uh, talking about open education resources and uh, spreading the word around the world. I think making awareness of open education resources is one of our major tasks for the 21st century. We have had a boost from the COVID-19 and I'm hoping that people take advantage of it and get into uh, open educational resources. So thank you once again for your kind invitation and uh, anytime contact me, my email's at the bottom. Great, thank you again, uh, Professor McGrill. Thank you so much. It's really been a, a fantastic 
a session for us this afternoon. Um, just before we close, I've just got two quick announcements from, from Nadio's side. Uh, firstly, just to say to everyone that attended today, thank you very much for participating in our the first in our series of webinars for 2020 at uh, Nadiosa. Um, we will be sharing both the slides and the link to the recording of this webinar. So if you registered for this webinar, um, we will send you the link to both the recording and the slides. Um, please also join us in, our, in the rest of our series. So our next webinar will be on the 30th of July. Um, the topic is going to be on the future of learning. Uh, we've got a speaker from South Africa, Kirsty Chadwick, who works in corporate uh, training and learning will be, will be speaking with us. So that'll be on the 30th of July. Um, but we will send out announcements um, and let you know closer to the time. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody, today. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed the session with us. We thank you again to our speaker for today, Professor Rory McGreal, for sharing um, his vast experience in terms of open edu educational resources. We hope that you can take something away that you can utilize as we go through this difficult time of COVID-19. Stay safe, everyone, and we will speak to you soon. Thank you.